miracles of technology bouncing across time and a lot of space. I think if I pointed accurately at you, you're probably that that direction. I'm on the east yeah. coast of Australia, and where are you, Shane Young? We're, we're currently hanging out in Falmouth Harbour and Antigua in the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. Anybody not familiar with you, Shane Young, Young Barnacles, it's a YouTube channel that I started following a couple of years ago. Uh, an incredible resource for those of us who don't have all the high tech skills in uh, boat refit and also performance sailing. You've sailed some big boats and also fixed and upgraded a lot of big expensive boats too. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, emphasis on uh, fix and upgrade a lot of big, expensive boats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those go hand sure. in hand, do they not? Even the really, those $5 million boats, people think, oh, well, it's perfect from the factory. It's going to go for 10 years. And well, really, they're kind of getting refit every few years, aren't they? Yeah, like now, $10 million boats, man. It's, uh, yeah, big, <laughs> big boats, big money. Um, and yeah, every, you know, it's just a bigger boat, bigger problems, bigger bills, um, <laughs> bigger tech, <laughs> and fewer people uh, to actually come and do it. That's that's the trickier part, and that's what keeps me quite busy. Um, I seem to be one of those fewer people that uh, goes out and fixes these things. So, that's good. Sure. Well, they all break, and you got to fix yeah, them. Yeah, they all break. figure out how to do it yourself or hire somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it's it's super cool talking to Nick because Nick's got a, a very cool uh, way of thinking about things. It's it's very similar to what Anna and I do. You know, you guys are, are there to understand what boats do, and that's that's what we're all about too. Just understanding how they work, how they fit with people. So that's cool. right. Cool to be chatting again. Yeah, totally. So um, one of your latest videos, I really got a kick out of. Uh, you were talking about how you chose the boat that you did, kind of the reasons why, and it really resonated with me. Anybody familiar with the channel knows we've been looking for a boat for a long time, and we get suggestions all the time. Hey, why don't you, how about this boat? How about that boat? How about this boat? How about? So there are boats for sale. There are boats that we can afford, but since we do have experience, we've become pickier and pickier and pickier because we know what we're getting into we know we're starting to know what's a big deal and what's not <laughs> yeah. yeah you know what you don't want yeah <laughs> totally totally so what i thought i would do since we both have quite a bit of experience um i guess kind of evaluating boats um whether it's for a client or for ourselves maybe step through i guess our process what we look at when we're getting those first impressions. So I'll just ask you, you, you called the owner and of course the boat is ready to go and it's been upgraded throughout its life and uh, sh she's as, well, the pictures are a couple years old, Shane, but you know, she's still looking good. <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you roll up on this boat, what are some of the first things that jump out at you and start telling you the story? Because I think the boats tell a story. Well, 110%. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. What's the story of the boat? What you you got to look through where it's come from, where she where she where was she born, you know? Where where who thought of this thing to begin with? So first thing I'm looking at, right? Who originally thought of this boat? Who designed it? That's the first thing you want to sort of get into. Is this a reputable designer? Has he got a good reputation for putting out good boats? When I turn up to have a look at this boat, what am I expecting to see? Am I expecting to see someone's backyard napkins uh, scratchings, or am I, you know, looking at, you know, something from Bruce Farr or Lock Crowther or, you know, one of these cool guys that have a track record of of a good boat so that's the first thing i've got to get in my mind am i starting with a good solid grounding of a design then like you said then we've got to start looking at what's the track record of the person that has actually put this thing together so i'm going to be quizzing right is this a custom build 
Is this a home build? Is this a serial build from a yard? What am I looking for? I've got to find out who put this together and what problems have they built into this boat? Because, and I, and I, and I I'm dealing with some boats at the moment where problems are built into the boats and you can't get rid of them. Um, so it's, it's a big one to sort of consider who put it together because someone, I'm going to, I'm going to, you'll probably be familiar with this now, Nick, coming, being down there in Australia. The Shawning is a very popular boat down there. Yeah. Yeah. And you get professionally built ones and you get backyard built ones, right? Exactly the same design, exactly the same philosophy, but the guy that put one together can be a hundred times better than the other guy that put the other one together. So then we've got to start looking deeper at, okay. Now, just because a backyard guy put it together and a pro guy put it together doesn't mean that the pro guy was better than the backyard guy. Right. And you probably started to see a little bit of that in Oz as well. There's Absolutely. some pretty handy guys down. Oh, yeah. Right. Once you've sort of got a little bit of background, who's designed it, who's built it, you've got a little bit of a mental picture of what to start going, looking for, All right? Am I going to be looking behind cupboards? Or am I going to be tapping out hulls? You know, what am I? What am I going to go looking for? Um, so now you're going to start looking for what is this thing made of? Um, okay, I'm going to use the shining again here as an example, uh, just probably because you're probably more familiar to it. They like to build the kit boats from balsa. Okay. Yeah, Duracore. Duracore, right? ATL in Australia sells this product. Great for making kits. It's a nice price point. Structurally, is all good. It's a difficult product to build with for a boat long term. I've been there. Got to put my hand up. Built both boats, and yep, I've been bitten. It hurts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're building a boat with organic stuff inside, and you mix that with salt water and air. And, uh, nature takes over and you don't end up with too much balsa left over. Yeah, what um, people don't necessarily understand about end grain balsa is it, what well, you have to look at, balsa in and of itself is not a bad material. In fact, you, you know, you can get a really good bond with the entire layup schedule. But you have to look at the inner skin and the outer skin because especially with the shonings, these things are built light. So <clears throat> your skin, maybe uh, just a few mils, it, it could be really, really thin. And that means that literally you could drop a screwdriver, put a little gouge in it, miss it, not even see it. And then 18 months later, you've got a nice spongy spot. Okay. Yeah. yeah some of these boats have really light skins with really delicate cores as far as water ingress is concerned. Um, you know, there's strip plank cedar boats as well. This idea of core material and construction method, it's a very deep subject. I mean, it, it can take years to learn all the nuances. And I've been shocked to find boats that are actually listed as carbon Kevlar but are actually strip plank because they were one off. They built them that way and skinned them. It's very, very difficult, but expensive to create molds for a limited production or a one off to do vacuum bagged vinyl ester, carbon fiber. That's almost never done, right? Mm. Except at the very, very high end. Is that right? Um, no. So. Uh, the one that will surprise you and the one that actually was a real leader in this technology of building good, durable boats was actually Ian Farrier yeah. um, in the Farrier Trimorants. So all of his boats are foam cord um, they're, and, they're, and they're skinned with either e-glass or carbon or whatever. They're all foam cord and, and Ian made a very conscious switch from being uh, glass covered plywood boats to using this foam core because he you know 
his boats were plywood and they had this bad reputation for being plywood and rotting and you'd end up with a you know soggy boat um so he changed the construction method and he was actually a real big leader and and that trend sort of followed a little bit in in oz in new zealand but then uh, atl came out with the the duflex panel thing and it was such an affordable easy way to build that that became a primary building method and all the rest yeah we're talking you know you 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 understand these build methods because you've been down there and you've seen it firsthand what these boats are. A lot of our North American viewers, European viewers, would be just like, "What the heck are you guys talking about? You're building a boat without a mold?" <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> it's a really cool thing with being down there in the antipodes that we didn't ha- we don't have the options of these big markets and all the rest of it. So everything is custom built, um, and we that's what we do and that's how we learned what we did and this is how we sort of progress quite well in in, in other parts of the world but um yeah generally speaking the the boats that you'll be looking at secondhand if you're not looking in this uh custom strip length boats uh going back towards the the molded boats like you're talking about trying to get high end but they're actually not so high end so if you look at your older Utramas, which you probably had a look at um some Just looked at one yeah there you go those older ones are actually monolithic mm-hmm. so for those that don't know what monolithic is monolithic means it's a single skin of fiberglass or carbon fiber without any foam or wood cores in it right um which is cool because you don't have any core problems uh you're just looking for five plus it's yeah pretty simple. totally uh, yeah heavy though but yeah <laughs> but it comes with its own challenges as well yeah. yeah yeah um yeah so digging into how the boat is built is is super critical to buying these older boats because this is the bit that's gonna hang you up this Mm. is going to mean you're going to build it you're going to be buying a full-blown two-year yard project or you're going to be buying an older boat that you can sail around and upgrade a few sails and electronics and bits and pieces and all that sort of thing depending on what you want to get out of it so yeah so that's the thing when i when i when someone's ringing me up come and have a look at this you know figuring out who designed it who built it and what did they build it out of because that 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 bit of what you built it out of is fundamental to the whole thing Um, so once you've done your once you've done your background and your homework and yeah you you figured out who put this thing together and on whose plans or whatever tell me about what you look for as you're literally rowing you know motoring up to the boat or hopping from the dock or whatever I'll, i'll give you a couple that i always go to okay first of all I'm always looking for brown, this very distinctive brown, shiny stuff around any penetration, stanchion bases, uh, basically any port light of any kind. If I see silicon, if I see any quick fix stuff, I immediately know a lot about who owns this boat and what I'm going to find inside. That's one of my first go-tos. Second is how are they treating their running rigging? Have they, if if the boat's put away, do they have all the rigging up? Have they sent messengers? Or if it's being used, how are they treating their lines? Do I see a whole bunch of spirals? Or do they actually know how to flake things and store things? So those are my two, as I'm just walking up, what are the first things you look at? Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Same as you. How has this boat been treated? Has it been treated well or has it been abused? Um, and, and and the boat, again, tells that story. Quick fixes. Hatches just fell out. Someone went down the local hardware store, got some silicon glued back in. Yeah. Now, this actually goes for looking down the sides of the hulls too. Always, when you're at the dock, go and look down at dock level look for dings look for holes we inspected a boat for an owner the other week and um it was a vinyl wrap boat and they were putting new vinyl wrap on at the dock (laughs) dock 
level <laughs> to, to get rid of i saw one of the ones i hadn't done yet and i was like holy cow that thing hit the dock hard yeah. um so that then raised other questions okay how hard did it hit the dock did it scuff the gel coat did it crack it did it rupture the skin did it leave a dent so this comes back to this uh talking about what the boat's made of if it leaves a dent uh is it leaving a dent in a balsa core a foam core uh strip plank cedar core if it was a solid laminate boat so like an older utrama which is monolithic um you'd be definitely going looking because that monolithic boat you know she's going to flex and bow in and all the rest of it go looking for stress cracks inside particularly if there's any furniture there because if it was near a piece of furniture that becomes a hard pot spot inside exactly. and sometimes yeah. it will pop a rib off pop a bit of furniture off so you go looking for you go looking for the evidence on the outside so you go looking for the story here's the story outside we've seen a scuff mark right what's that produced on the inside um tap around it, see if you can get some sort of hollow yeah yeah whether it's a monolithic cord and all the rest of it um yeah if it's left the ding or likewise is there a gel coat patch there you know when you look for down the sides of the hull, you sort of sit at the transom, look towards the bow, and you'll see that there's a bit a patch of gel coat that's not the same shininess as the rest of the boat, or it's just not quite the same colour. Yeah. You go look and hang on. Why does that piece of gel coat not look quite like that piece of gel coat over there? Yeah. Um, so I mean, the, the good news here is that glass is, is pretty easy to fix. So as long as it was taken care of right, this may just be another question, which is who fixed that for you? When did they exactly. fix it? Did you take a photo before you fixed it? Very smart. Hey, all boat owners, you have a boat, you have a ding, things happen. Take a photo before you fix it. Just so you can yeah. show somebody, hey, listen, look, wasn't that big a deal? Because you can, especially when you're trying to match gel coat, you know, the scratch could be this big. The repair could, once it's fared out, could be like that. Could look like a massive log hit your boat and it was, you know, it was a nail on a piling, you know. Does that correlate with what you were sold before you drove to the boat? That's right. another big one. You yeah. probably, you've probably come across this a lot, you know, what was on the internet ad? And then what's staring you in the face when you've got to the dock? <laughs> you know. Do you think there's some psychology there in that, you, you know, I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt. I don't think everybody's just going around lying about their boats. But is there a certain amount of just, let's, let's just call it denial that people might have about their boat? Like they, they upgraded the electro electronics seven years ago, and in their head, these are new electronics but yep. they're not new and it's got fresh engines that were rebuilt. Well, you did heat exchangers and the exhaust elbows four years ago. That's, you see what, you know what I mean? There's this nuance where maybe the owner remembers getting the bill and paying the bill, but doesn't necessarily remember what the bill was for. <laughs> yeah, that, that scope of time in between when it was done and what he can remember is, you know, <laughs> Yeah, my, my kids give me a bit of grief about that as well. <laughs> dad, you did you did that job like two and a half years ago, Dad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there's always this curve. I, I, I've, I've been this way myself where there's this initial um, honeymoon season, I guess, you'll talk about where you get the boat. You're super enthralled with making her yours and getting her up and all that stuff. And there's this initial spend, if you got it, if you budget for yeah. it. And then is you know the boat maybe not going to be your forever boat and i'm not sure how many more seasons we're going to do this honey and well she's getting by just fine as she is but we're not going to upgrade things there's this yeah. curve and so we tell our clients this you know the ideal boat to buy is refit within a couple of years and for the owner it just the lifestyle wasn't what he was expecting, but he spent well. That's what you want. Yeah. Four or five years down the pike, now you're starting to talk about, you know, replacing some of that gear. Yeah, yeah. So there's 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 two uh, trains of thought here. So we've got 
uh, you know, we've got clients in, in two price brackets, you know, the one we were just talking about. And we've got clients that are talking lots of seven digit figures. There's a client that wants to walk onto the boat, turn the key and go yachting. Okay. The, that sort of boat that we're looking for a client is is the hardest one to find right now. Um, and it's the hardest one to find for stock um, because exactly like you said, you've got to find that guy that's just got himself all prepped, ready to go. And something unfortunate has happened that, you know, the wife, kids didn't like it. He didn't like it. Um, family members, circumstances outside his control, something yeah. happened, business fell over. You know, there's a million things. He's now stuck with his boat. It's ready to go. You're the lucky person that's ready to go and pick it up off their hands. They are around, but the old saying is they're like rocking horse poo. They are. <laughs> yeah. Um, then there's the other clients that have been kicking this can down the road for a while, trying to find this dream boat and realize actually my dream boat's not there. I keep looking and it's close. I want that boat, but I want this on it. I want that boat, but I want it to do that. And this is a this is a more interesting client because they are now the, the person you want to get the rundown, beat up boat. And you got to then convince them, okay, you're going to get this rundown, beat up boat, but now you're going to make it your boat. And this is a tricky, uh, trickier conversation to have. But once you've actually had it and it's a go ahead, it's actually quite good fun in that you are now in this, not quite a new build, but it's a build or it's a boat that's coming to you. And it's going to have all the stuff that you want. And what you're looking for between the two is very different. Very much. So, okay. So trying to find that guy that's, left the boat behind and it's in good work and order you're, you're looking for some simple obvious things of you know um uh, is the gel coat dull is did the, did the guy install the new electronics that are new like only less than a year old new did he install them properly um so it's it's a pretty much run by the numbers sort of thing checking out what work was done was done properly etc etc looking for fundamentals of the structure generally because the boats already had someone going through it and generally someone's giving it a lot of care it's not going to be one of these boats that's been left on a pile and bounced on the bottom and against the pile or against the dock for the last two years um yeah not the boat that's going to have been beaten up so much so the, the the hunt to go and chase the structure and see what it's made out of and where it's gone wrong is not such a big focus yeah you definitely want to go around the decks and check tap around the winches chap around the clutches uh bits and pieces like that go and stick your head in places looking for oopsie someone missed something and there was a soggy patch under a winch right right the other one is sort of a bit of the what we are so when we look for our boat i said after the boat before we had this one was an old wooden boat and you've got to do it once in your life and you'll only ever do it once in your life yeah. <laughs> i don't even want to do wood core anymore <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah man we had a 1940s carry launch oh, oh my nice goodness next level work um beautiful thing but holy dually more work than you can poke a stick at yeah. um yeah so this this boat was okay we're not going to get a door up run um <laughs> well that went really well for us didn't it? <laughs> yeah I, I think you know the the client or i think the supplies to megan and i right now um where you are looking for something that needs work it, it needs equipment it needs yeah. some attention i think where experience really pays off or having a, an experienced advisor pays off is to actually go through and determine what's a big deal and what is not a big deal because there's some things that sure look like a big deal and they're it's nothing 
And there's other little itty bitty things where you gotta go, uh, we need to learn more here. I'll, I'll go first, okay? Dull gel coat. Dull gel coat. Boat's been sitting out in the sun with no protection for three seasons because of COVID or they went bankrupt or, or whatever. That's some of the cheapest, easiest stuff to fix. Dull gel coat. You get a couple island guys, and for two two grand, you can have this boat shining. They may go through a lot of compound, but that's not a big deal. Yeah. What can be a big deal is if that gel coat has got little fractures and cracks in pretty specific areas, and they're almost always in specific areas. You say it first. Which are those areas where you don't want to see cracks in the gel coat? We don't want to see cracks in your gel coat. Yeah. So this this is this this is a good one. Yeah. Um, where you're looking for uh, what we call stress concentrators or hard points in the boat. This is where the corners come together and the boat's wanting to move. Um, so the first one you want to try and get under is under the wing deck. If it's on the hard you've got the opportunity if it's in the water is a little harder right but in particular where the wing deck meets the hull at the back end so you're coming onto the transom of the catamaran uh and you're looking towards the uh, under the wing deck this is a highly stressed area of the boat right when you're on the hard it's very easy to sort of be down below looking up at this 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 bit so it's sort of the the transom of the wing deck what we call the the back beam yeah. yeah, that sort of comes into the hull. That is point number one. You want to be looking there, making sure there's nothing going on there. And it's not just the gel coat cracks. A lot of these boats, it is actually a hull to deck join as well there. So you'll see like a seeker bead where the, the, the hull has been, or the deck has been joined on the top um, in these areas. That's where you want to be looking for the, the seeker um, and this, this glue bond popping apart. Right. So you're looking in this area. That's that's the first place you want to look. The other ones is around the windows. Um, okay, so here the window, blah, there, well, finger, there, corner, ah, right there. There's there's a corner there. That On the outside, you want to go looking for stress cracks in the corners there. And again, this bit behind me is where the mast sits. And I got a mate, yep, yeah, that's, that's got a, a catamaran at the moment, and he's just had this massive crack open up where the mast step is, and where it joins into the deck. Um, and yeah, it was it was uh, yeah it was a Lagoon 380, and it was a, a small superficial crack that turned into a not so small superficial crack and. He's, he's literally hauling his boat out tomorrow to have this thing repaired. Um, so, yeah, again, uh, back corner of the, the boat, around the windows, particularly the windows next to the mast step. The mast step, you don't want to be seeing any cracks, any Jolco cracks around here. Uh, other hard points, chain plates. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got lots of videos on chain plates and then failing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fascinating how... What I love about what you do with your boat, what year is, is Paikia, by the way? 1990. So she's a 1990 boat. That's 30. Wow, that's 32. So, yeah. but to see how far you go with overbuilding the original setup, I just love to see that. I mean, this is a yeah. really strong boat now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 becoming quite bulletproof. Um, How about our attachments at the forward cross beam? So when we got a bolted beam, it's a little bit easier. So uh, you you remember with your leopard, you would have had a, like an aluminium block thing that would have had four or six bolts bolting it to a molded flat piece up on the bow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very easy. You'll see stress cracks radiating out of the, the bolt areas for these things when they start moving. Very easy to identify and not what you want to see, but very easy to ID. Yeah. And like in the case of the Shoning, they've got, mm -hmm. you know, their cross beam is kind of integral. But just about everyone that I've, I've seen, I've found stress cracks. Is that 
you have to determine then whether that's fairing with you know yep. more flex than it can handle when you're getting into boats like how i've upgraded our boat where we've now got an integrated beam uh and like you said like the shonings and uh the eric la rouge um boats you know, fantastic way to do it but again um you've got to come back to who designed it who built it blah 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 uh and determining the difference between a fairing stress crack and a structural stress crack gets a lot more challenging um and we have a, you know we've got seagull strikers on a, a very nice full carbon longer on at the moment uh that had a stress crack turn up around the bottom of the seagull striker hmm. and it was full oh poop your pants panic stations um because this is not what you want on a five million dollar boat um the only way to confirm whether it was a problem or not is to actually remove the fairing yeah. um thankfully it was in a small confined space and when i re removed the fairing uh it wasn't too intrusive and the a repair would be easy but to be honest the repair actually hasn't been done because uh, the the captain's happy just to keep an eye on just making 110 percent that that's the case but you do need to dig literally dig deeper into the fairing to chase that crack to see if that crack has gone beyond the fairing and into the structure right um so th this is a little bit more of a difficult conversation to have when you're talking to uh owners and you're looking at their boats and saying hey i'm just gonna pull my pen knife out and just yeah dig out the yeah, fairing don't here don't do that <laughs> so don't do that yeah yeah so some of these some of these cracks can be de de design deficiencies but often, especially on the lower end boats where you where the captains are maybe less experienced, there can be DIY, DIY rigging and rig tuning. Um, hey, you know what? I cranked it three more turns and it's still flopping on the lee side, so I gave it a few more. <laughs> yeah. You ever heard that one? Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How's your banana boat going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So some of this can, it's not even the ocean that's caused the problem. It's actually the owner. And that's, that's why I think it's, it's important to get the full story. And it gets really difficult if you're, this is owner number four, you know, and it's yeah. been bouncing around from hand to hand. It only takes somebody cranking on one of these and sailing around for a day or two to really screw things up. Um, so yeah, you can taco a boat. Oh yeah, and it's it's a thing, you know. When we're we're doing tuning boats, uh, little ones and big ones, um, we get to this stage where the platform just can't take any more rig tension, and all you're doing is just bending the boat. Uh, some boats are much better than others, but yeah, you, you once once you've got rig tension, uh, you've got well maxed out on your platform rig tension, then that's it. You can you can pull that side stay on harder and harder but all you do is just yeah just keep bending your boat up sideways it's, yeah and yeah say, yeah some so, people just don't get that staying with the uh, gel coat and uh finish sort of evaluation um mm -hmm. what are a few gel coat crazing or crack areas that typically don't concern you now I, this is gonna be nuanced because it depends on what sort of backing you might have behind a cleat or whatever but what do you think about spider webbing around cleats yeah okay so spider webbing around cleats is at the end of the day depending on it depends a little bit on what you, you you're you're looking for is um i'm happy to see where that goes and i'll repair it a year yeah. or two down the track or not um generally things around hard points like uh dock plates <laughs> you know has this guy docked somewhere where there's a mega surge and has been wailing on his dock cleats and yeah there's heaps of cracking around it um mm -hmm. yeah it's a problem that there's that area's seen a lot of welly a lot of hate and it's a small problem not a it's biggie not, not a major problem so to go in and repair it well that depends on what's inside too 
Depends on how many liners and things are in behind that sucker. Yeah, exactly. And there's a cord up there because frequently, you know, at that part of the deck, if it's coming off the deck, they will stop the core at the deck. So, but if the coring is in there, you could have a, yeah. a big mess. Okay, I'm going to screw up the name of this part of the boat, and I know there's a proper term for it, but in the transoms, in the sugar scoops, you've got the mold for the steps that's typically, uh, that would be a, uh, that would be one mold, and then you've got the whole mold, and they're usually joined at the edges, creating what I'll just describe as a gunnel. Would that be... Yep. 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 Yeah. Te technically, it's the the gunnel continues its way way down there. Um, so yeah, that's and we refer to that as a hull to deck join, even though it's the steps. Um, it's yeah. part of the deck. It's definitely not the hull. Um, could technically be argued that it's a transom, um, but. Yeah, yeah, it's it's such a gray area on these cats. Well, maybe we can flash um, like a diagram or something to show people what it is. Yeah, exactly. You exactly. you often find cracks on the interior, and I know pretty much how and why this happens, because it's very easy to back a catamaran up against a pile or up against a dock, and you may or may not have the fender in the right spot. Big deal? <laughs> or not such a big deal? Okay, if it's a Lagoon 380, it's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I got a mate, another mate, not the one with the mask, another mate who had his 380 smashed like a 25 ton steel boat run into the back corner of his boat, exactly that spot that you're talking about. And it's the biggest bang I've ever heard out of a boat crash right in front of me ever. And I we were just like, oh my God. <laughs> And, you know, of course, first thing, apart from getting steel boat offset, we're doing 380. <laughs> was, okay, is this boat going to sink? Is it broken? And so straight down into the, the engine hatch there, because that axis is straight into that thing. And, dude, it, it left a scuff mark on the gel coat <laughs> and absolutely no structural damage at all. I was blown away at how strong that is. But that is only that boat. That doesn't mean everybody's yeah. like that. Um, yeah, so you are definitely looking for, in that back corner, like you said, um, you're looking for stress cracks on the inside and things like that. Is it an issue? Nine times out of ten, no. Um, you're going to see a, a potentially a big spider crack there um, on the outside. Sometimes I'll try and gel coat repair them. So don't gel coat repair them that will manifest itself in a in a dark spider crack coming back later and things like that so it's it's a cosmetic thing um but unless it's actually ruptured the skins it's not gonna be a problem uh, it, it'll always be a cosmetic problem so those are some of the cosmetic things that, that jump out at me uh i'm happy to hear that you're looking kind of at the same things that i am I want to yeah. uh, move move on, and so now we're starting to go inside and look around. I'll tell you, the first thing that jumps out at me is the smell of the boat. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like I can tell a lot about a boat from how it smells. I'll tell you a couple smells that I don't worry about, or one in particular, and one that I absolutely, positively go, wait, what's going on? What I don't worry about is sewage smells. Mm. All right, you got old hoses or the crapper's backed up or your sewage tank is leaking. We're talking about $2,000 to $3,000. If I go in and I smell an ammonia or this very specific kind of acetony ammonia smell, I start thinking about osmosis. And most people don't know you can actually get osmosis inside of boats. Mm. Yeah. The other one that I go for is that compost smell. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. That, the sweet that one, smell. That sweeter, you know, um, yeah, that, that something organic is not 
long for this world anymore. It, you know, the, the the elements are taking it back, and this comes back to what we we're talking about before. Um, so yeah, the like you said, the poop smell. Nobody likes it, but hey, whatever. <laughs> it's a boat, <laughs> and everyone's going to have a poop story yeah. <laughs> at some stage in their life if they yeah. own a boat. Um, so yeah, that's that's a very low priority one. The the yeah, the ammonia smell um, is it's a little bit rarer um well, i certainly haven't come across it too often but generally I just did pop those bilges which were dry they knew i was coming but i could see a line i could see a line and it was almost up to the cabin sole and i knew this had been sitting for for quite some time i guess yeah. this goes back to where we we think about how the boat was built because even with a monolithic build like an Ultramare 5055, which, you know, unless you crash them, they're kind of bulletproof. Um, yeah. You know, they're still using or used plywood in stringers. So again, yep. standing water, you know, it only takes a year or two before you can eat away at plywood. So yeah, it's that organic smell. Anything else, uh, when you just come into a boat, that impression, something jumps out at you about that tells you a story about the boat. Hundred percent, yeah, yeah, it, and it's and it's really good. It, it sort of rings an alarm bell too when you've gone to see a boat and it's all open and aired out versus you've just walked onto the boat and it's been locked up for the last week or so. Unless, unless obviously it's a liverboard, you know. But yeah, if it's a broker's boat and uh, yeah, I just got everything ready for you and it's all good to go, and it's like okay. Where, where where am I looking first? What am I looking for? And exactly like you say, right? You gotta go. You gotta go sleuthing. You gotta go snooping around, looking for the evidence, looking for the story. What's the story it's gonna tell you? Yeah. Look for the tide line in the bilge. Yeah, uh, the tide line. Out... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. Because <laughs> um, nine times out of ten, the broker's gonna have someone take the water out, but they ain't gonna clean the bilge, and that tide line sometimes stains, and they can't get rid of it. And nine times out of ten, there's a little bit of grease and oil in there as well, and it leaves a nice little line in there. Film, um, yeah, yeah. So just the weakest hint of ammonia. I didn't really smell much that that sweet organic smell on this shoning, but um, I was reminded why I kind of cut myself off from shonings. I, I'm just. I can't do it anymore. I'm so yeah. tempted. They're so light and they're so affordable. But every time I'm just like, ah, yeah, home build. You've got, you, you've got, you've got to find that one. <laughs> right. And, they're, they're, and again, they're like rock and horse food. They're the good I ones. Well, I feel like if I built it, you know, and I had maintained it, at least I could just blame myself for that gouge that didn't get didn't get taken care of but anyway um i'll give you another one that i look at uh or at least it, it spurs new questions is recently removed equipment uh that could be a um a patch in the nav station uh or it could be in the engine rooms uh an alternator uh, a second alternator bracket without an alternator and you say, why? What happened? The best one, the one I love, is the spare skin fittings. Yeah. <laughs> that's always that's always a good story to try and fit nut out. What were these for? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you know, honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah. In, in the case of like uh, recently changed out electronics, it's one thing if you're getting ready to cruise, but rarely do people replace electronics preparing to sell. And so that could be maybe a, a lightning strike. Um, on the same boat we were looking at, the secondary alternators were removed. Well, they had a lightning strike. You don't, you don't take out $5,000 worth of alternators unless they got cooked somehow. Um, yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's you know, the okay. So that lightning strike thing, we we know um, firsthand uh, three three guys that have been struck, um, and that problem runs deep in a boat when it's been struck. Yeah, the, 
and this is why insurance companies hate covering lightning strikes because it's a never ending gift of yeah. woe. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like literally right down to your build pumps and floats will eventually poop themselves. Um, yeah, we were very surprised at how consistent with the three boats was the lightning strike, the initial breakdown of, of components that, okay, stuff blew up when you got hit, but it was the following two months yeah. of stuff failing was the biggest whoa okay yeah. stuff is still either we hadn't switched it on for the last two months and you didn't realize that you had uh it's a, a usual one but the it, it fried it enough to cook it but it didn't quite fry it enough to stop it from working and it had to be used three or four times for it to go ah, pfft, i'm done that circuit's gone yeah. yeah yeah i think um this is People won't even believe this, but uh, we have 18 um, personal contacts, 18 boats we have met, so yeah. have been struck by lightning. So this is a common occurrence. It does yeah. not condemn the boat. It doesn't condemn the no, boat. Boats get struck by lightning. It happens. But uh, as long as it's been gone through and dealt with, then, hey, there's no problem. But it does lead to another warning sign that I see on boats or something that I just spurs more questions is um, when I look at panels, especially, uh, you know, electrical panels, and I see wires to nowhere, um, something was wired in or new wiring needed to be run. Uh, why? Because tracing unlabeled wires on a boat is um, electricians go so far as to say, I won't do it. I'll rewire the boat for you, but I will not trace, you know, 30 circuits. I mean, I will, but I'm going to charge you 150 bucks an hour to do it. Yeah. 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 And this, this boat's a classic for it. So the previous owner was uh, a telecoms guy and, you know, just like the mechanics car who never works, the, 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 the Italian telecoms guys, <laughs> electrical systems are, <laughs> pretty pretty interesting and yeah like the one of the jobs the kids hate doing with me is chasing wires uh nine times out of ten we actually are just ripping them out because they haven't been connected and obviously haven't been connected for the last 20 years um and it's dead weight we're carrying around and that's nothing annoys me more than carrying dead weight around as you probably know um so yeah we we pull these things out and Pulling these things out is so tricky, and it comes down to like we're talking about the deck cleats. If you're going to pull these things out, how's the boat built, and how are the liners put in? Because the liner systems on older boats are a lot more integrated. Is, is, is the best way to put it than a new boat. So the newer boats, the liners are a lot more easily removed to try and get access, whereas the older ones are a lot more built in um so to look at if you've got a problem to fix inside of this older boat um it's not just a case of, oh i'll rip that hood liner off actually you got to rip that hood liner off and you actually find out that the vinyl has actually been stapled yeah. to the inside skin it's like yeah oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> okay yeah. all new all new world of hurt just turned up um so. Um, let, let's hit a couple more, uh, looks to be a small issue, but needs to be worthy of investigation. And then maybe a couple other looks kind of scary, but Hey, we can figure this out. Um, I will go with mystery galva galvanic corrosion. So, um, we just had to replace our sail drive. Don't you, we, this boat comes with a new SD 60 sail drive. Great. Why'd you have to replace it? Uh, yeah, why <laughs> yeah 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 did you hit a log did you did you run aground did you wrap a uh, you know wrap something around it if all of those questions come back no then yeah exactly like you say what did the old one look like <laughs> yeah how many holes did it have <laughs> yeah was it swiss cheese or cheddar cheese <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this falls into the category of looks like it might not be a big deal, but could be a, a huge headache, and that is stray current. 
Um, it's actually pretty difficult to figure out the sources for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and we, we actually have it on our boat. We're port side, perfectly fine. We don't have any stray currents, stra starboard side. For some unbeknown reason, we've got some earth leak there and our starboard side anode eats away at twice the speed of the port one. Um, you know, so we've got to keep an eye on it. And we've got to change that as quickly. Yeah, and there's this underlying problem and we cannot find it. Um, you know, yeah, this one, this one's a really good baffling one. And we've got engines with that have three sensor wires on it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's not like we're chasing stray computer and, and um, you know, 10 million wires coming into the thing. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an odd one. There, there are some really weird anomalies too. Like we've got a wart and this, I have a sneaking suspicion um, that it is actually coming from a water heater, this stray current into the thing because uh, we have a water heater where the uh, 240 volt element died. And because it's, you know, it's a 30 year old boat, it's still the original water heater in it there's potential stray current in the water heater and because it's also engine heated yeah we now have a connection between one part of the boat and the other part of the boat via something that you would normally not recognize as being the primary source very and yeah but interestingly enough it's a stray current that's so small that it's hard to find but it's yeah. enough to make you know yeah and you know so it's it's one of those joys <laughs> the but, never ending yeah. story oh yeah and things like you know uh your fresh water systems on board the boat uh one of the things i definitely do is you know just, you just walk around turn the tap on uh turn the tap on and you get a waft of what does the fresh water system smell like Mm. because to clean one out that's gone moldy <laughs> all oh. right quick story time <laughs> it's only partially related i don't know if it makes it into the video our first big cruising boat were no nothings i had a merit 25 before knew how to sail but didn't know anything about cruising boats and uh there's always this phase. There's the honeymoon phase when you buy a used boat, but there's also a curse the seller phase when you buy a used boat. Why the heck did he blank? And uh, we just buy this boat, and you know it was full of, you know, it had water in the tanks, almost empty fuel tanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go give it some fuel. We're gonna get over to the fuel dock and and. I'm get, I got the nozzle out and I'm, I got the little deck key. I didn't even know how that worked really. You know, I was just like, oh, okay, that's what this is for is to unscrew this. And I, I don't know what made me pause, but I, I just, cause the, the fuel fill and the water fill were, I don't know, within arm's length of each other. But I, for some reason, I just thought, I thought the water, I thought the water tanks were in the salon and then the fuel was kind of back by the engine. So why, why is the fuel cap up here? <laughs> and I ran downstairs and I, and I looked and I found that sure enough, the deck fill, he just swapped them. He had painted the decks and he just put the, the water one on the fuel and the fuel one on the water. And I might have just about caused myself a whole world of trouble because these tanks were built in <laughs> scrubbing yeah. diesel out of a water tank would be a near impossible uh, you know you you could be flushing it for ever ever you'd <laughs> never get rid of all that petroleum but no. even yeah just even little things so oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's the i uh, well not just the i why they're uh some very expensive boats and the water fill and the diesel fill are about that far apart <laughs> i mean even just it's a like, little spillage you know yeah it's like this has got to go wrong one day <laughs> yeah one way or the other 
All right, yeah, so we scared yeah. we scared the hell out of everybody looking at used yeah. boats. Uh, yeah. You're gonna, you're, you're going to find a lot of these on a lot of used boats, and it just means more investigation needs to happen. Ask for history, ask for insurance claim um, paperwork, ask for pictures of damage, um, and and just you know realize that when you get to survey day, that's going to be at most eight hours of an expert's time and he's not going to be able to go ultrasound every inch of your deck uh, you know what i mean yeah. um so yeah. it behooves you to bring along somebody who has been on a lot of boats and and uh get an educated eye <laughs> yeah it's it's um like it's it's a really difficult one and like when we when we surveyed this boat we found a lot of problems but a lot of problems we were like okay that's a problem but it's not a real problem so we, we were making you know we we're talking earlier is this a is this a big crack or a simple crack you know what's the what's the level of the crack is that i can live with that or oh this boat's going to fall in half uh, 10 miles off the way um identifying the the severity of these things is difficult also judging the severity of these things in where you are in the boat that you want to buy as well is, is a big consideration so uh, like when we wanted to start this project i didn't want to have to work on it but of course our budget drove a lot of things and being stuck in the country on the other side of the world sort of pushed us a little bit hard to, to make it all happen we just ate some stuff that we've found it's not right um so there's this level of okay there is something wrong with this i've got to go and investigate it can i live with it can i do it or do i have to get someone in to do it you know do i have the skill to to investigate this problem um or do i have to employ i i just don't know how to do composite work so i ain't gonna touch that <laughs> um you know, they're, they're the sorts of things that you got to you got to weigh up that, OK, also, you know, some guys go, it's an electrical problem and it's electronic related and it's going to be a 30, 40 grand fix. But I'm comfortable with that and I'm going to dive in there. And that's my gig. Yeah, no, I'm I'm like it. playing wise. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. but a sewage pipe, I ain't touching. That's like a $50 <laughs> problem. But I'm going to get someone else to do that. <laughs> it's you know you bring up a really interesting point. It's like that old Clint Eastwood. It's a movie quote. He's, you know, man's got to know his limitations. And so it's almost yeah. like it's like you're evaluating the boat, but you're also trying to be real honest with yourself, saying, "All right, I'm great with you know carbon fiber laminate, but I am I am not touching." an engine i just have no interest in dealing with a crankshaft or or whatever yeah exactly e exactly so knowing your limits so there's there's boats that have issues like um uh, i will look at a boat and i'll go huh, that bulkhead is completely cooked uh and all the rest of it's all good and yep yeah, we can go with that because i know i can get in there i can tear it apart i can tear a bulkhead out and put a new one in and we go off sailing or i could live with that bulkhead for six months before it's a major problem whereas some people will look at that gate ah sell nah, the boat yeah yeah hey exactly. okay. um and likewise some people will go perfectly good platform but the engines just died uh they had 40 million thousand hours on them and i just can't go there i can't afford to buy new ones i don't know how to rebuild them i don't know how to do whatever it is whereas someone comes in and goes oh, i'm a diesel mechanic and i'm looking for a boat and he's going ha ah, whatever there's a weekend job you head know? gasket ah yeah. Half a day. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah and he'll probably go you know i'll polish this thing and we'll get a few more horsepower out of it while i'm in there <laughs> right right uh, so knowing yeah. yourself yeah yeah knowing yourself and what you want and what you want to get out of it because there's also this other small uh side of the thing where we we're talking a little earlier about you're looking for a boat but not you know nothing's quite right there you actually find a boat and it's in good condition with its bones where you go actually i don't like the galley the galley sucks the rest of the boat is awesome and it's in 
good enough, Nick, for me to take this thing and go sailing with it. But I've got to rip the galley out, put a new one in. Okay. Um, there's this whole thing of, okay, how hard is it to take the galley out? In this? Okay. Our boat is a classic example. That's a bunch of plywood that's screwed in. So for us to take the galley out, there's a dozen screws and a couple of glass tabbings and the whole galley's gone. Right. And we can put a new one in. You get other boats like a Fountain Peugeot, the whole galley is molded as the deck structure and the whole lot. So yeah, to get in there and go, hey, man, I want to change this galley. Uh-uh. Right. <laughs> Guess <Yeah>. what? Pick <laughs> another boat. <laughs> right, right. I, I guess we're to the point with the slim pickings that we're seeing that a galley could never be a deal killer for us at this point. Galley up, galley down, galley in the cockpit. <laughs> I'll deal with it. <laughs> so, so shifting gears a little bit, um, you've been around boats and seen the market through ups and downs, as have we. Uh, what do you make of what we're seeing right now? Um, it's been a weird couple of years. Yeah, yeah. So we're seeing the second big up in secondhand boats. Uh, we saw the first up. When we bought our boat, unfortunately, we 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 did everything you don't want to do in buying a boat when we bought this boat. <laughs> um, but when we bought this boat, uh, Cyclone Irma and uh, Hurricane Irma, and what was the second one? I can't Maria. Remember. Maria came through, destroyed hundreds and hundreds of charter boats, and all of a sudden, the secondhand market went berserk because there were no secondhand charter boats to sell. Yeah. Um, so there was this huge, big up in the market, all the rest of it. It settled down and tapered off a little bit. Um, and then we're seeing the second wave after some big event, which was the whole COVID thing. People were like, hey, <laughs> land life sucks. Let's yeah. go play with boats. Um, so we're seeing this massive wave. But the difficult part that we're seeing is that there's, when we were looking, people weren't looking for boats like ours. This sort of blew us away when we were looking for our boat. People were saying, go buy a good sailing boat, go and buy a Lagoon, a Leopard, a Fountain Peugeot, these condo morans. And we're like, whoa, you know, what's, you know, am I missing something here? I didn't, it doesn't compute in my head that these are a good boat. But anyway. There was a lot of uneducated, um, or not uneducated, inexperienced, inexperienced people come in and um, look at these boats, take them sailing. Ah, it goes forwards. It's a good sailing boat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, I guess, you know, it's a good sailing boat. Works. Um, without saying it at how good it was at sailing and all the rest of it, thankfully we stuck to our guns and we, we took on the boat we did because we knew what we were looking for and that we wanted a sailing boat primarily and secondly that we could live inside it reasonably comfortable um what we're seeing though now is this massive dry spell in new boats that happened a long time ago when um, all these charter boats were essentially driving boat builders to have to build these charter boats because yeah. the, the charter boat market was so big, so much money, so lucrative that if you weren't building charter boats, you were going bust. Um, so the boats like ours sort of disappeared. You know? Catan is a great example. I mean, it really is. Yeah. And I think it's absolutely silly to blame you know, the company in any way. It's it's nice. supply and demand. And if you've got a bunch of customers saying, this is what we want, you're an idiot if you don't build what they want. Exactly. Yeah. If someone walks up to you for an order for seven boats, one one group or one person says, I want seven charter boats that are three quarters of a million dollars each. And one dude comes up, I want one boat. Yeah. <laughs> Max. Yeah. Three quarters, yeah. maybe a million. Where are you going to put your business? You know, it, it's it's a no-brainer. 
and this this is this is the reality of it this is what happened um and this is why we see so many charter boats available to us and at good prices at the end of the day you look at the price of of these charter boats they are one of the part of the design brief is they have to be cheap um and absolutely semi-disposable at the end of the day yeah um, yeah. um but what that does is it sort of skews the whole thought process of what people think is uh the real price point of a boat and all the rest of it. i can get this 45 foot condo moran production boat for x amount of dollars or i can go and get a chris white 45 footer and the price difference between the two is moonbeams you know yeah uh, but the difference in well you know yourself the difference in the the design and build styles and qualities are are, are moonbeams apart um, it, it's almost not even the same type of craft at the end of the day you know it, yeah it's just i like your analogy in the last video you did about the um you know buying a bike you know you buy a criterion bike or a road bike and you take it up you know you want to downhill it on a mountain and you're gonna be yeah. sadly disappointed with most of your teeth missing you know <laughs> and, and you you know you take your mountain bike out on the road and you're gonna be at the back of the pack so yeah yeah I, they're building for a market the builders have limited capacity because you know these boats take specialized labor they they take knowledgeable people to put them together and it's just there aren't a lot of really really experienced uh composite boat builders out there so there's only so many boats that they can they can build so we've seen this second wave possibly spurned on by folks like you and i who, who yeah <laughs> nice videos which you and i i feel like we both try and keep it real so pat on the back uh, yeah yeah to us but uh there's been this wave of honey doesn't that look great we should do it too and you know we just sold the house for five times as much as we paid so let's do it um where do you think we are in that wave yeah um it's yeah the 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 thing i've been seeing more and more is like exactly what you're saying we've got people now saying don't go and buy a condo moran like when i was buying one that that's what you go and buy to now go and buy a, a hh55 or a, a utrama 5x or you know one of these nice boats and people can afford them the issue is do they actually want that style of boat? Like we're talking before, what do you want to get anything? You know, it's, these guys are probably best off in a, a Neil Trimaran or a, a Lagoon or something like that, you know, where space and, and entertaining is, is their thing. Um, but because everyone's saying, no, go and buy a Rapido Trimaran. No, actually you want a Neil Trimaran. Um, it's, it's getting very muddled again. Um, and the other issue that's coming up is there's other people that are at the lower price point like us that are trying to find these performance orientated boats that just aren't there. They just, <laughs> they aren't there. They're, <laughs> they're not just, for sale. But, yeah. Yeah. They're just not for sale. Um, because there's just, they just stopped making them a long time ago um so to to get one that's that's reasonable to deal with it's it's hard to find and for mums and pops that have just got a big chunk of change in, in their pocket to go out and find one of these things especially as a first time boat is pretty high risk <laughs> yeah yeah when you're going all in you better know exactly what you're in for and what you're looking for yeah the, the pendulum may swing again um if you look at the listing for Utremer over the last five months it, it went from basically nothing to several 51s um mm -hmm. uh, a handful of five x's and prices are coming down on those so yeah maybe 
in fact, I know of one particular 5X uh, who was purchased by a, a wealthy gentleman who uh, did one ocean crossing. It was too scary. It was just, it was yeah. too much boat. And so it's been parked yeah. for um, over a year now with continued price drops. Um, so yeah. again, maybe that pendulum swings, you know, people think they want a performance boat, but don't realize yeah. just how much different the ride is between a Lagoon uh, 450 and, uh, you know, an ultralight 45 footer. I mean, it's totally different. It's the difference between, I don't know, like driving in an SUV versus driving in a uh, Ferrari Testarossa. I mean, a Testarossa, your butt's this far off the ground, you know, there's, there's this much travel in the suspension, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not a relaxing ride. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, this, actually, this is a funny conversation we have a fair bit at and I, um, as as to the comfort because we we do have a lot of friends now that have got their condom brands and they love them, and we'll do a, the same passage that they do, and our experience of that passage is very different to theirs. Nine times out of a ten, ours is more comfortable. Is what one of the things that we did find so there, there is there is a there is a limit okay yeah. there, there's um so this is one of the things that's taken me quite a while to get my head around is coming from the the world of really fast okay there's the world of really fast and then there's the, the world of cruising fast and then there's the world of cruising boats that just will never go fast um the world of really fast is uncomfortable. Okay, there's there's no question about it. It's it's not fun sitting at and above twenty knots all the time is not fun. So the amount of guys that come and ask me, I want a twenty knot cruising boat, tell them no, you don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I get the weirdest look in their face. Hmm? Um, you don't want a 20 knot cruising boat. It is not a cruising boat and it is not fun. Spending life at 20 knots all the time is not fun. A boat that will touch 20 knots is a different thing to a 20 knot sailing boat, okay? Mm -hmm. My boat's done 18 and a half knots. It's near, so technically under some of these guys' eyes, my boat's nearly a 20 knot boat, <laughs> you know? Um, so for me, you, you tell me a 20 knot boat, that's a boat that will sit at 20 knots all day, every day. Um, you don't want a boat like this. We do find, we have found that even even sailing the big HHs and the gunboats for a lot of miles, our comfortable number is 12 to 14 knots. That's the comfortable number when physics is still playing the game where you are not being shaken to pieces inside. Um, once we start to get into the 16 knot mark, even in these bigger boats, life starts becoming unpleasant you, yeah. it's not uh it's not frightening like 20 knot world but you're all of a sudden you're on edge and all of a sudden just to get from the saloon down into the hull by the steps is no longer you know it's a it's a thought out process it's, yeah it's a difficult thing okay so um and 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 your Utramas don't spend a lot of time there, but they will spend a lot of time at that 12 to 14 knot mark, which is comfortable. But even 12 to 14 knots for a novice person, uh, particularly newcomers to sailing, is fast. Mm. Um, and, and it is enough to scare people. But the biggest one that we found is that the power involved to make these boats, particularly these bigger, like the 5X is a big boat, you know, yeah. nearly 60 foot boat. It's a big it's rig. Frightening. Yeah. Okay. And, um, we're talking to owners at the moment about big boats um, and crews and pro crews and that crossover between uh, owner operated boat and fully crewed boat. And the threshold actually becomes load. It's not speed and it's not size. Um, the biggest one is load. Uh, the actually physically handling these things, and we're seeing it a, a bit with the bigger Utramas where um, owners have the money but not the experience to deal with um, the, the 
physical load of this boat. You know, you, you get a code zero of a 60 footer. It's a lot more sausage to handle than your 45 footer. Yeah. And a little, little got, wrap up top becomes a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're operating a, a Harkin 80, <laughs> as opposed to a Harkin uh, 25 or a 40, right? and the loads associated when you, you're giving it an ease, uh, not as scary. And then when you start jumping up into nine, you know, Harkin 990 pit winches and you start easing and you've got two and a half tons on the other end of the piece of string, that's scary. Yeah. And it, and it does affect people at how scary these loads are. Um, yeah. that's, that's a big thing that we've actually been finding where people, uh, getting onto these bigger boats that they can now afford, particularly the more performance orientated one is not as much the ride that scares them, but it's the speed in combination with, I've got a lot of power yeah. that I've got to deal with. Yeah. That's, that's the frightening part. And I can't, I can't get rid of it easily. I can't relax because everything is just so torqued up. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, like it, it, if you have a wrap on a winch, like, okay, on uh, a smaller boat, I don't know, maybe you can take a hitch back to a cleat or something like that. On a big boat with a tremendous amount of load and it's wrapped, you better have another winch in the right spot or be able to bring a block to the right place so you can take the tension off. And that's something you learn by watching somebody else do. <laughs> it's not something that you experiment with on the spot. And, no. you know, un, un effing a situation on, uh, on a highly loaded boat can get traumatic, scary, and dangerous, honestly. So once you see that and you realize that right in front of your face, you know, it's different than the vision of your in your head of just, you know, ripping along at, you know, 16 knots with, you know, cocktail in your hand. It's yeah. and all your mates going, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think another factor that that is maybe drawing people towards the more performance oriented boat. And I'm not going to call any particular brand out at all, but um, they're just better built boats. They, yeah. they typically have to be. Um, they're stronger. They are twisting and flexing a lot less. And from a user experience, what that means is a much more solid and quiet ride. Um, a large production boat that gets into a seaway, you know, the thing isn't necessarily going to break in half, but it may sound like it's going to break in half. And, you know, Dealing with that for a, a day or a, a night and a day is one thing, but you know, four days of that, you know, can really um, right. stretch you out. Whereas you get onto a performance-oriented boat that's, you know, the bulkheads are tabbed all the way up, and in and the deck is too, and it becomes more of one piece, and they just don't make as much noise. They they, yeah. they typically don't creak as much. There's not a lot of movement they make different noises yeah 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 they, they make the noises that you want to hear you want to hear the the noises of the water going past the hull fast you want to hear the water of you know the noises of the waves banging and crashing and all the rest of it they're the noises that you want to and expect to hear from a boat that's going well what you don't want to hear is your cabinetry squeaking across the ocean day in, day out, and knowing that a liner might fall down on your head. <laughs> or a window will crack. Or <laughs> Yeah. So when you when you were saying, you know, you're doing the same passages as a condom we're in and the experience is much different, it's it's just you know, it's not the same noises. I mean it's kind of a simple thing, but it's it doesn't feel it doesn't feel the same as when the whole thing just, you know. Yeah, and it's, and, it's, and it's honestly not the same ride. So there's a little bit of physics that come into it. You've got skinnier hulls. When a wave comes up below you, the, the way that it accelerates you up and down is a lot gentler to what we've been seeing um, at 
experience actually at anchor that was actually the one that was the biggest surprise to us we will actually sit at anchor in a shitty bay way longer than anyone else and it we thought you know uh you know maybe we're just a bit silly and we we, we can tolerate more rubbish um but what we actually found was actually we're on mates condomorans and once the sea state inside the bay came up those things bounced around a lot more than our boat did yeah. just because they got bigger fatter hulls and they bounce up and down on the water more yeah. we got skinnier hulls and the waves literally would pass under the boat much gentler um so that was a big surprise to us that we ended up with a nicer anchoring experience when the anchorage got a bit snotty yeah. um we, we we didn't ever think that that would be a, a something that you would get from a performance cat we would always think that it would be the other way around admittedly they are much more comfortable in the you know the in and out flow and the the barbecue on the oh, back and no, all the yeah. rest of it that yeah. we were man holy cow yeah. but <laughs> as far as going to sleep that night we definitely had a better night's sleep <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'll be interesting to see where design goes from here because it's it's always going you know the designers and the builders are always going to chase what the consumer wants i mean it's it's a business so it'll be interesting to see if maybe we see uh, an evolution with one of the bigger builders towards maybe what balance is doing or closer to what HH is doing, you know, where they're going from, you know, not super light boats, but lighter boats built strong with still some decent accommodation. Will the mass producers try and mimic that instead of just the, the huge volume um as usual it may yeah. be the charter market that drives this i don't know yeah so here's a really interesting thing that we've been talking about with some others uh, of late and that is getting the sale versus educating your client um and this was actually it was a conversation i had with the builder of marcus's boat the pegasus um awesome dude uh very smart been around you know he's he's a cool dude to talk with and we were talking about rejecting customers um and and it's a funny conversation because him and i we're, we're very happy to say to someone no i'm not i'm not the person to work with you and go and find someone else that will take your business um and it seems to be quite a rare thing at the moment in the world in general but particularly in the marine industry where everything is more 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 bigger is better and all the rest of it and, well we're just gonna we're gonna sell you a boat with an eight foot headroom uh in it and it's like why just because you can doesn't mean yeah. you should uh and this was a classic example of getting the sale versus educating the customer um you know unless you're client is seven foot five or whatever it is you don't need an eight foot ceiling in right. a sailing boat right you just you just don't and it had knock-on effects with windage on the boat and all the rest of it and it was, it was a whole nother fiasco um but the boat would have actually been much better off if the builder said ah uh -uh, i ain't doing that this is why it has to be a six and a half foot ceiling height in here because of this that and the other the the salesmen and the builders are so scared of losing one sale that they'll just bend to whatever ridiculous call there is from a client and this will be a, a call from a client that has never sailed a boat before yeah this this for me is the craziest thing and where a lot of where we are at right now has actually come from you know a lot of the charter market has filled this bill of making boats for people that don't understand boats and making them feel comfortable in them that's fine but that's influenced a lot of the market and what we're seeing where we can't now find boats that act as a 
proper sailing boat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just a different mission. I mean, if, if it's a charter boat, uh, why do you need all this good galley storage? Because, you you know, you got a grocery store within a half day sail. And, you know, why why do we have to have the water maker accessible? Why do we need a water maker? I mean, there's water yeah. there. It's, it's yeah, it's building for for a purpose. And uh, yeah, it's. I wonder if it's a generational thing because you talk to some of these old school guys, and uh, I don't know Tony Granger, but I know people who know him. You know, and somebody wants more headroom, he says, "Well, then we just have to build the boat a lot longer," you know, because <laughs> he wants the yeah. same proportionality. You know, yeah. he's not going to screw with the lines of the boat, but he, you yeah. know, he sticks to that and. I imagine Chris White's somewhat the same way, you know, like, no, this is how you build it properly. And uh, I guess we could maybe move the toilet a few inches, but you know, yeah, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's, and, and if you start bending on one little thing, then the client gets, ah, oh, you gave me extra headroom or why not give me this and give me that. Then all of a sudden the designer is no longer designing the boat. The designer is designing the boat. He's the guy with the knowledge, the experience, and all the rest of it, not the client that's coming to ask the expert to design them the boat. Otherwise, the client would be designing the boat, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah. Or you end up with some uh, Frankenstein, uh, I'll call them out, you know, the excess catamarans. You know, you go on one of these and you see a, a bunch of ideas in yeah. practice all kind of put together and you think, well, was there a designer handling the helm and there was another designer handling the galley and another designer handling the, like it doesn't, it's not a symbiotic thing. And that's what boats are. They're this symbiotic, but ser I would say series, but it's really an unlimited number of compromises. <laughs> every, yeah, yeah, every give is a little bit of take. And where do you want to massage that for what you want to do with it? Um, yeah. Who, who would you say is your is your favorite if you had to have a favorite who do you think is doing it right and doing it best right now at different price points do you ever give that much thought yeah <laughs> okay this 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 one's going to be a bit you're going to have to cut out <laughs> <laughs> oh if you don't want to go there i won't put any of it in there we can cut the whole yeah. thing off yeah um so th th this is really hot topic at the moment um where, where do we go because people can't find boats they've been down the Utrama routes and they're stuck um and the kids keep asking me the same question that what boat would you go and buy out there who would you go and get to design it and actually it's 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 there's there is nothing out there that's spinning my wheels there's some that are close but um we've actually had two people actually come and ask us to draw something up so um something new to the market something new but not new um it will it will look so we're, we're definitely looking at bringing uh modern aesthetics to the market but not you know you look at what tony grange is drawing up and it's very much like uh what alan carwardine's doing and all the rest of them they're very voluminous and very square and yeah very abrasive it's probably the, the word to to use they're, they're not a sort of a harmonious look and then we've been you know with a lot of chris white you know, we, were, we were with a 57 just the other day and it's like they just work but they look like that's something that's just come out of the 1950s. You know? <laughs> what would happen if a uh, gunboat, a Chris White 72, had a baby, then turned into a serious conversation about being a 60-foot boat? Um, and then we've got another client at the moment who is desperately running around trying to find a 60-foot boat at the moment and is going to buy, unfortunately going to go and buy a gunboat, get really disappointed with it and um, he's like yeah i'm gonna buy it and then we're gonna build this other thing yeah so and in between yeah seven million yeah. in between yeah it's yeah freaking freaking crazy world um <laughs> but this guy that buy uh, wants to build the 62 is like 
well, why can't my mates who can't afford this 62 not have something cool like what I'm getting and we can't do a, like a 45 foot version that's super simple then it's a it's a price point it's like okay <laughs> yeah here's, here's another drawing six million dollar yeah super simple 1.6 million sort of yeah not not even it, the the where i we're trying to say sub sub million dollar bike really uh, like super simple yeah carbon yeah uh, hey carbon no oh, okay. no not carbon got to get we get so we got we got a few hurdles that we've got to sort of try and figure out and it comes back to the exact question or the same conversation we've been having Who, who's going to build this thing yeah shane young young barnacles thanks so much for your time guys check them out that's young barnacles on youtube and you're doing something that i think we need to do megan megan you listening yes putting out a newsletter good on you answering questions and all that stuff thanks for joining us Thanks, guys. It's been great talking to you. All right, cheers.